We have three speakers. Shall I start with... Uh, that 
they work for. Uh, and uh, despite the fact that the Women's Rights Directive is, you know, should be implemented in Poland, it's really on a very low uh, stage. And, uh, and there is absolutely no political will on the central level or even on the, uh, on, on, on from the side of public authorities to raise awareness about, uh, about anti-LGBT hate crime. I have a feeling, you know, we, we don't have really uh, that much uh, research done on, uh, on the um, opinions and uh, the way anti-LGBT crime is perceived by society, but we know that there is still low acceptance of LGBT people in society. You know, the level of acceptance is growing, but still it's very low. And I have a feeling uh, that also homophobic and transphobic behaviors, even if they are not hate crimes, and they are not really violent uh, incidents, uh, it's, it's normalized. Uh, it's like perceived as a part of the experience of LGBT people. And the language that we have been using uh, in society, you know, talking about anti-LGBT, crime and violence as something that is actually that the reason for that is the sexual orientation, is gender identity. You know, I now am very aware of the language that I use to really make it clear that the reason for this crime, for this issue, that's for this, vi this violence, is the bias motivation, is the attitude of the perpetrator, not, uh, of course, the fact you know, that certain people are targeted is because the, of their orientation that is actual or or at least thought of as, uh, as being one by the perpetrator, like alleged, but still the problem are the attitudes, not the fact that people have different or sexual orientation or gender identities. And it really is, uh, I think we are still struggling with, um, with the language and uh, because uh, LGBT people have daily experience of being exposed to violence starting from home uh, and that's why one of our campaigns was focusing on verbal and uh, psychological violence at home, you know, the, all the words that we are hearing at, at, at home, uh, but still we have a feeling that it's normalized, that it's just seen as a part of an experience of coming out to your family, that you have to face the comments, you know, on the way of your family to, you know, accept the fact that you are different. So it's really, uh, I have a feeling that we have a long way to go, also because of the fact that we know that, that it's normalized, that violence against LGBT people is normalized. And, and it starts with the fact that we accept homophobic slurs and comments and we accept all kinds of questions that seem to be neutral but they are not and you know that it, they can the, such attitudes can grow to to very serious uh, very serious uh, incidents and uh, I just don't want to speak from the position of an expert because I don't really see myself as one and uh, to share good practices with you because I really am not sure that they are good practices. I just wanted to share some thoughts that I have and uh, some experiences that we have at Lambda Warsaw, what we have done and, uh, and uh, that might be an inspiration, uh, but also like I personally have many doubts about the ways we do stuff around hate crime and I basically wanted to share that with you uh, because it seems to me and uh, throughout the Come Forward project we really were focusing on the fact that lack of law, criminal law on anti-LGBT hate crime is the main problem that we have. I am not so sure about that because uh, I'm a lawyer by the way. But I think that we fetishize, fetishize, fetishize the law. That it's a fetish. That we think that if something is in the criminal code, everybody's going to understand that it's bad. No. <laughs> uh, another thing is, if we have this in the criminal code, it means that people have access to justice and people who are perpetrators are going to jail. No. You know, so I think we have to overcome that fetish. Because we know from you know from all other countries, I believe that you know there are so many 
protocols in the system of, for instance, sexual abuse and rape. You know, the fact that a lot has changed in that field, it doesn't, doesn't really mean that victims of sexual abuse and other forms of sexual violence are not humiliated in the courts, are not victimized that people who deserve to you know, be punished for that actually are just, you know, having punishment that they deserve. It's just not true. So maybe, you know, we, uh, and that's why like, the session is also like what to do if we don't have law, but I think that maybe also we should not be focusing on introducing anti-LGBT hate crime to the criminal code. I know that you know, it's, it may be controversial what I'm saying. Maybe that's not our priority. I just, I just am thinking this way. Like I started to come to this point that maybe it is not our priority to have that in the criminal code, especially when I think about you know there are different political situations. But there is absolutely, I think that there is absolutely no chance to introduce that in the criminal code in Poland anytime soon. So maybe you know, the, maybe in a way we are just not ready. Not only because we have lack of political will. But maybe we just are not ready as society because still, you know, there are so many different factors within society, uh, which for me the most important one is that we have lack of understanding of hate crime uh, in general, but of anti-LGBT hate crime. And for me, our priority maybe should be to have people on our side because if we don't change societies, we don't change the way of hate crime being perceived as society, if it's still normalized, if it's still like thought of as a marginalized problem, something that happens maybe you know from time to time, why do we care? Uh, that you know if we don't have people on board and if we don't have like really strong pressure from the society that you know in general understands the problem and the fact that there should be solutions, I think it's going to be very hard to convince politicians, you know, it is really, you know, it is really a, you know, a big problem, you know, because some NGOs are saying that. I think we have to have people following us on that and I think it's hard. So another thing is the language. You know, we have tried so many different things, like how to talk about anti-LGBT hate crime, that is understandable, that is, you know, gets people's attention, because, you know, I have a feeling that in, uh, in many cases we use very scientific language, you know, because we have a lot of research on hate crime and anti-LGBT hate crime, and of course we want to be credible, we want to be professionals, we want to be experts, we want to, you know, like be really credible, so we use all this language, you know, to, to, to look smart, to look like we know what we're talking about, to, look, to make it look like it's a serious uh, cause, because it is, of course. But I have a feeling that people don't really understand what we're talking about. So if we, of course, there are different discussions and different kinds of language that we use among ourselves, you know, people who work in the field, who understand all this uh, language, but I don't think that people will follow us if we keep doing this. Because uh, even those who have this experience, because, you know, it, I, so I think it's also for me that we are doing this. I mean, one of our actions is actually gathering the evidence writing reports, you know, having this conviction that actually we need data in order to do advocacy. To, because we need evidence-based advocacy. That is absolute, there is no doubt about that. We cannot just go to international bodies and share our stories anymore. It used to be like that, but we have, you know, opposition there. And they are, you know, really strong. So we really needed to take this step up and and uh, now, you know, actually have a lot more work because we have to have research that is, you know, credible, that is very well done, that, you know, we cannot be, you know, really questioned about it in a way that, you know, people doubt in what we have done. But, uh, but there are, you know, so I think it's also like that we kind of forget about people who have experience of being victims of anti-LGBT uh, hate crime. Uh, and, uh, and we started, I think,
think it's a good practice, but it's, uh, I think we still are a bit lost in that to, you know, because one of the things and one of the actions is to convince people to report, to make them understand that it's important. But they don't, right? And we don't know why. And uh, we don't, like, we, ha we think that, okay, if we have this flyer, let's do it. It's going to be perfect, in my case. It's going to be like, everything is going to be there. You know, we're going to explain what hate crime is. Very simple wording, you know, examples. Like, it can happen everywhere, in this setting, in that setting. You know, it's this type of, kind of behavior. No, it was one page with all the definition, but we decided that it has to be. It was also a compromise in our group that, okay, it has to be there. So, like, official definition that is, you know, like, nobody understands it, let's be honest. So, uh, you know, so we have examples. We have, okay, why do we need this data? We're going to explain it to you, why, why it's important that you give us the data, what we're going to do with the data, <coughs> like, how we're going to protect your data, especially pr pr personal data that it's just not, you know, like, revealed anywhere. And everything. And it didn't happen, you know? It was perfect. I was like so proud of it. And I realized that, you know, when we, it was within like different projects, and we actually were planning, officially planning to gather 25 cases. And we did, you know, because we knew from the beginning that it's, it's not gonna, you know, rise to a thousand all of a sudden. So we, we just, you know, designed it low because we knew that, you know, maybe it's not gonna work, but, to be honest, I was so hoping that it's going to work because everything was there. And I know now that no, that I have nothing, I don't know anything about those people. Who, what they really need to report because apparently this is not enough. I have to do something else uh, because that is just not working. You know, although I explained everything in very simple wording, no scientific language, no legal language, no, you know, being passionate, you know, professional about it in this way, like being an expert and telling people what to do. They need something else. They, you know, something that empowers them in a way. But we have to remember that the fact that people experience something, such as, you know, different things that could make them activists on the case, that it's simply is not that, that simple, you know? That people, and they don't have, they, they are not obliged to be. Like, you know, I'm the last person to say that like, you have to report, you have to, like, you know, become a member of our organization and, you know, let's fight for this only because you, it happened to you. But still, there is something that uh, that these people need in order to report, you know, even if, even if they don't need support because one of our core activities at Lambda, and I perceive that as a good practice, <laughs> uh, and I think it's only fair uh, to provide support for victims of, uh, of uh, any, any crime, any violence, if you're like, working on the issue. I think it's, it's, it's just our obligation, you know, not to demand from people, you know, certain actions and do not, uh, and, and not back it up with, okay, but you can also count on us in terms of legal or psychological support if you need this, you know, but even if you don't, you still can tell us about your case because it's important that we know. Uh, but still it's like, you know, people still in many societies have problem with seeking for help with, you know, so how, how to basically like combine the two, like speaking from the position of like empowerment and, you know, and, uh, and at the same time, maybe this offer to help, you know? So how to combine the two so people feel empowered, but they also can seek for help. So, you know, like also reversing the support services in terms that it's also empowering to seek help, you know? Because we, uh, we especially, I think this is the case of Central and Eastern Europe, that's what I know for sure, that, you know, seeking for help, for support, is a sign of weakness. Is you know, like, it's it may be adding up to a person feeling a victim. You know, and of course the, the wording here is important. The word victim in Poland is like very very bad. So we're trying also to use you know the language of experience.
experience of one that's rather than, you know, because it's just a bad, bad word in Polish. But still it's like, uh, how to, you know, how to, in a way, convince people that seeking for her can be, for help can be empowering. And that uh, it is, you know, it, that is not weakness, that it's, they, that they don't have to deal with that themselves. Uh, and, but it, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that if they get support from us, they owe us something, you know, that they have to be, you know, active on, in this fight for, for whatever our priority is. I still don't really feel that having anti-LGBT hate crime in the law is our priority and should be our priority. But I think that, uh, so of course, you know, what we can do and what we do are trainings for, for law enforcement officials, for, uh, uh, for prosecutors, uh, judges do not really uh, have that uh, idea that they could be trained by the <coughs> because, you know, like the status of a judge in Poland, uh, which doesn't make really much sense, but still like they feel like they know everything. Uh, but also, what we do, uh, Piotr was talking about that uh, yesterday, I believe, uh, that we think about different alliances within the, uh, the non-governmental sector. So we, uh, we want to see, and we want people to see anti-LGBT hate crime and violence as uh, a part of the problem that we have with violence as such. So it means that, uh, you know, the, some of the mechanisms behind, you know, violence uh, against LGBT people are exactly the same uh, and they, you know, that we should have people who work on domestic violence, on sexual violence, or violence against children, you know, on board, because it's not, they are not separate things, you know, they can also happen within the same settings, uh, for instance, within the family, and, you know, be domestic violence, but also anti-LGBT violence, that we should, you know, think about it as a wider problem, and we have to keep in mind that the fact that someone is a victim of anti-LGBT violent incident does not mean that they will come to us for help. Because uh, what is uh, important is that, you know, people sometimes do not, uh, LGBT people do not see that characteristic as something that is defining them. And, you know, if I'm an LGBT person, I have to, you know, seek help within LGBT organizations because, you know, whatever they do, they have everything covered and because I'm an LGBT person, I will go there and, you know, I will find help. They also go to, uh, to other organizations, like with, if they're teenagers and you, they, you know, they have uh, an organization that works with children and youth, they can go there. Or, you know, if, they, if violence happens within a family, they can go to a, uh, an organization or a group or something. Especially, you know, in Poland there are not that many uh, LGBT organizations, most of them are in big cities. So, you know, we have to have people on board from different, uh, different organizations because LGBT people can simply go there, you know, because uh, they choose to, but also because they have no other option in their uh, closest uh, area. So, so different alliances with uh, with those organizations are, you know, like something that we have decided is is just crucial and it's really important. And also with social services because we know that people who suffer from violence, from you know, bias motivated violence, can go there, and that stuff that works there have to be uh, has to be aware of the fact that you know there are some some special needs that. Uh, that people that the, the, that people who, who suffer violence, you know, because of prejudices uh, based on sexual orientation and gender identity, that they you know they, they have to be sensitized about that. That they have to understand you know different forms of violence and different um, types of victims that they have to uh, have to work with, and that is very important to uh, to uh, to do that. And uh, I think that another thing is that we, uh, what we do, and I think it's really important, 
is uh, relationships with media and having uh, people on board who will talk about the issue uh, in a way that is understandable for general public, for for you know not only experts, not only NGOs, not only you know people who are uh, involved in some way, but uh, to I think it's of course I think it's going to be just a you know very simple thing, but you know I think we all know that that you know we raise awareness through media as well, and uh, and the fact that. Not only the fact that media do not mention some case is problematic, but also when they mention in a bad way. Uh, and, uh, and I think that also because of the media, this, what I spoke about at the beginning, the normalization of homophobic and transphobic uh, behaviors uh, is also because of media, because the way, of the way they write about such incidents, you know, and it's really uh, not enough the level of condemnation of such incidents is not really enough, you know, and uh, I think it adds up to to the fact that people, like the general public, they understand that, okay, it's happening, it happens from time to time, you know, I read it about it, you know, twice a year, you know, it happens, but what's, what's the big deal, you know, and, uh, and I think that also one of the things that we were focusing on was to to really make people see how big the scale is, you know, how uh, how often it happens. That's why we want the cases, that's why we want people to report, that's why we want to report about this. And we are always, you know, like worried, uh, what if we have just 30 cases, what if we have just 50 cases, you know. It's not enough, we know it's a lot more happening. But I don't think that, uh, and of course we are concerned about that, and we want uh, we want the actual scale to be visible, to be uh, understood, and you know to be worked around. But I don't think it's gonna be it's gonna go very slow until we really have like, mass reporting. So I think that you know right now we need to work around these many cases that we have to, you know, not to really be, I don't know, in a way disappointed and, you know, like, feel like it's not enough and it's not going to work, but to, to build around that, that it's, you know, it's a lot, you know, that every single case is too much. Like, we were talking yesterday at the work that that was the only murder that happened. But, you know, and, but it's not that it's not a big deal. I mean, that's just, you know, one too many. And, uh, and you know, it's uh, the same was with, uh, with, with suicides among young people in, in Poland, which we had the two within the past three years. And, you know, it's not that it happens every day, but still it happens too much, too often. And I think it's also, you know, the way that like, we're, we're trying to, to really see the, this many cases that we have as, as a big number, you know, and to, to sell it in a way to media and to, to public opinion as way too many. And it's just, you know, we, maybe we don't really need, uh, and maybe we should overcome this, you know, idea that, you know, we're going to be credible and we're going to be trustworthy if we say that it's a thousand a year, you know, and that we have evidence, I don't know, we have people behind it who are going to talk about it and, you know, we have the, this whole, you know, evidence on that, that maybe we should overcome that. That's my, my thought, my, because also, like, from the beginning, I told you that also they want to share some doubts and, and, and ideas and my personal thoughts that, you know, what could, could be done. So I think that uh, I think that maybe that's also the way to go. To you know, not to really focus on uh, on introducing hate crime in the law, but of course, uh, but supporting those who decide to go uh, to the police and report and take their uh, their case forward, and you know, be sure that they are not left alone. Uh, because I think that's also a problem that people do not believe that uh, that they can, 
you know, manage uh, to, to go through that uh, by themselves and, you know, not be humiliated, victimized and, you know, left alone. Uh, but, uh, so I think that support is, is crucial. Uh, and, uh, and I think that also we really should focus on, uh, on having people on board in terms of, un of better understanding of, of the case. And in order to do that, I think we really need to seek for, for better language, you know, that is, and from like talking to people, not from the perspective and from the position of, of experts, but rather focus on uh, real <coughs> experiences of people, and, uh, and trying to have them on board, uh, those who actually have the experience of, uh, of, of, of violence um, uh, against them and, you know, to have them. Of course, it's always, uh, you know, with the campaigns that real stories, real people, that it works together, but maybe it doesn't have to be for the reason of, of a campaign or a certain campaign, but maybe, maybe this idea for, like, general, working on the issue that we should find the way to speak to people who have this experience because you know I think that the focus is still on politicians and other you know public authorities and, and uh, I have a feeling that they don't really listen to us and we have you know and we share all these thoughts, all these ideas, all these demands and everything that is not heard on the other side but we have a lot of people here who have this experience and who also want to hear something and they don't because we are focusing on, on talking to people who are not listening and you know and of course we still should do that but it's not one message I think so I think that, uh, that maybe focusing on on those who have this experience is, is also crucial and if we do that it's going to be a lot easier to, uh, to make that problem visible for, for wider, wider uh, public. I don't know if I, I probably have exhausted my time. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. It's my experience that the more daily questions you ask, the better an expert you are. So. <laughs> um, I will now give the floor to uh, Monica Sankarina from Militas Research Center. Thank you very much. My name is Monica Bissankaneva from Militas Resource Center, which is one of the partners of the Come Forward project. And I will talk about the case of Bulgaria in the fear of uh, anti-LGBTI hate crimes. Uh, you may have already received a lot of information about Bulgaria because yesterday uh, Denise Lubanova from, Blas, uh, from um, Based Fear uh, Association was talking and she's a lawyer, she probably introduced the legal situation, I was not uh, in that session, uh, sorry about that. But I will try to illustrate the legal situation and the, the social situation um, with some examples, so that you not only hear the facts, but the, I mean, the facts about the law, but also how people live in this situation in our country. Um, and uh, Katarzyna already covered all the aspects, I think, of what it means to work without legal framework in the sphere of hate crimes. Bulgaria is not much different from Poland, neither in, uh, with regards to the legal situation, nor with regards to the politicians and their attitude. So we have a very, very similar case. Um, nevertheless, there might be some differences, uh, because until now, not a lot of work has been done with the police, not a lot of uh, common work between LGBTI organizations and police officers and police structures. And this creates a gap which leads to a lot more complications when um, a hate crime is not uh, prosecuted. So I will start briefly with the legal framework. In our penal code we have um, several articles which treat hate crimes, but there is no general definition of hate crimes. So uh, hate crimes are not defined, but there are 
uh, they fall into the category crimes against the rights of the citizens. Uh, in this category, Article 162 are um, prosecuting uh, crimes against uh, on the basis of uh, race, nationality, or ethnicity, which are determined as aggravating factors. And then um, Article 163 is uh, for, for organized attacks on the basis of these three characteristics, race, nation uh, race nationality, or ethnicity. Then Articles 164 to 166 treat uh, the crimes on the basis of religion. So these are the characteristics which are explicitly mentioned in the law. Nothing else is mentioned there. Nothing about sexual orientation or gender identity uh, or sex characteristics. Which means that the law doesn't help much victims of anti-LGBTI hate crimes. And unfortunately, the attitude of the public uh, authorities is no laws, no obligations. This is uh, the very brief summary of the attitude. During our research in the Come Forward project, Bilitis requested official data about the crimes based on uh, sexual orientation or gender identity, which have been committed in the last two years. 2016, 2017, and we sent official letters to the Chief Prosecutor, to the Minister of Interior, and to the Director of Sofia Directory of uh, the Police, and we received official answers that um, the, the prosecution said that they are not obliged under the law to keep statistics on such crimes. The same was the answer from the Minister of Interior, that the Ministry is not obliged to maintain any statistics on such crimes, and they cannot answer our question. And uh, surprisingly, the SOFIA Directory of Internal Affairs, they replied that in the last two years they have zero registered uh, cases. Um, which means that they are maintaining statistics, but they have zero cases. And this is uh, totally not true. Because in 2016, at least, uh, there was one very popular case which happened right after Sofia Pride. A woman was attacked when she was leaving the place where Sofia Pride ended in Sofia. And um, she was prepared that she had a spray in her backpack and she sprayed the two attackers who were men. And the three of them were arrested and sent to the local police department. Um, what happened, the Pride organizers, we are among them, uh, immediately organized ourselves. We, we sent a lawyer to help the woman to file a report in the police department, but the lawyer was not allowed to meet with the woman. The lawyer was outside, the woman was inside, and somebody from the police actually forced the victim to sign a declaration that she doesn't want to use a lawyer. So this is how the police treated her. Um, and she signed, because I, I guess she was stressed and so on. She signed the declaration, so the lawyer couldn't help her to file a report which emphasizes the homophobic motive of the attack. Um, there was something else. When the, this reporting ended, the woman was released, and she had to leave the police department alone and outside there were already uh, there was already a large group of uh, radical, radical radicalized anti pride people who, who have quickly organized to, to go to the police department to protect their you know their people um, so the woman was released she she had to leave the police station alone the lawyer left with her and they took a taxi and they managed to escape from the crowd, which was shouting and you know insulting them and so on. So this is what it means: no laws, no obligations. The police is not obliged, obviously, to protect the victim, especially when um, she has uh, signed that declaration that she doesn't want a lawyer. So the crime was not prosecuted for. Uh, it was. Uh, just something, but, but at the same time, we contacted a lot of mass media, and some reporters were on the case, so we had afterwards, for, for a week at least, there were reports in the mass media, on all TV channels, um, and interestingly, some media uh, even uh, 
described the situation as if uh, the attackers were very severely injured by the gas spray. So <laughs> it was uh, uh, an interesting way of uh, portraying the situation, which means, of course, we need to work more with the media so that at least they are on our side. But you know that mass media in Bulgaria is not totally um, free and unbiased. Uh, we, we have here some uh, situation of uh, controlled media. So the reports, obviously, of different media would be different in such uh, cases. Uh, this is just an, an, an example illustrating a case of uh, attack in a public space. There are many, many other cases which remain invisible because they don't take place so publicly. Uh, they don't take place when there is an LGBTI event. So it is difficult to be associated with a homophobic or a transphobic uh, motive. Um, I'll give an example of another case, the case of a robbery, which happened actually to my family. Um, my partner, Paul, uh, who is an intersex activist and uh, who uh, received legal gender recognition in 2017, one year before, uh, he was robbed uh, in the center of Sofia, um, his laptop was uh, stolen um, and um, actually we are not sure that that was uh, um, you know, uh, anti-LGBTI crime because it was stolen. He, he stopped the car in the center for 10 minutes to go to one office and in these 10 minutes, when he was in the office and uh, before coming back, the, the car was uh, robbed and the laptop was stolen from the car. He went to the police to file a report immediately. And um, the police asked him to write a detailed explanation of the situation and everything. They were referring to him with Mr. because he looked like a man even before the, le the legal gender recognition. Um, and he filed the report, but he had to insert his legal name and uh, data from the ID. So after inserting the legal name and data from the ID card, the attitude of the police officer immediately changed. And it changed dramatically. Uh, they kind of um, neglected immediately the report and uh, said, oh, you know, we cannot do much about such situations. Although laptops are easy to track uh, with I, you know, some uh, tracking uh, system, uh, as soon as they are online, for example, or something, they can be tracked, but the police was not very much interested in the case anymore. As soon as they saw that there is a difference between the legal gender of the person and uh, the way that the person looks. Um, that's another situation. It's difficult to um, research such crime as an anti-LGBTI crime, of course, but Obviously, there is something which is missing, and this is in the attitude of the police officers. Uh, the sensitivity is missing, and their readiness to provide assistance, no matter what is the gender identity or the sexual orientation of the victim. Uh, so a lot more work needs to be done with the police. And of course, the, the change of the wall will not immediately change the situation, but at least we will have the legal basis which will, uh, how to say, provide the prerequisite for working more intensively with the police and not to be uh, pushed away with the excuse that they don't have the time because they are not obliged under the law to do this. For example, we had uh, a lot of problems inviting police officers to come to the Come Forward training uh, because they are not obliged to deal with such crimes and of course they didn't say that openly but there were official letters stating that they are overloaded and too busy and it's very difficult to, to provide uh, officers for the training. So in the end um, we are using personal contacts and uh, next week uh, we will have one training in Burgas thanks to our colleagues from uh, Burgas. Um, uh, NGOs, but um, it, it was really, really very difficult to involve police officers in uh, such sensitivity trainings. Um, so, and 
some, some more words about the legal framework. We have the law of protection against discrimination. Since 2004, it, uh, con it considers sexual orientation and gender, female, male, as grounds, but not gender identity, nor gender expression or sex characteristics, intersex. Since 2015, uh, an amendment in this law was made and uh, a new ground was included, which is determined as change of sex. This is the exact wording. It's very interesting, the lawmakers didn't consult with any LGBT experts when they formulated the amendment. So this uh, terminology, change of sex, is until today not clear. What kind of protection it exactly provides? Does it provide protection to transgender people who are post-legal gender recognition? Or to all transgender people? Or what exactly it protects? But change of sex is another ground. Um, you may have already heard yesterday in the presentation of the meets about the extremely aggravated situation in Bulgaria as a result of the strong anti-campaign against the ratification of the Istanbul Convention. Um, actually, in the period before the um, ratification, when Bulgaria had signed, but not yet ratified, there was an attempt of the government to transform the, the criminal law uh, in relation to the Istanbul Convention, and then LGBTI activists were invited to take part in a working group at the Ministry of Justice to harmonize the law. And I was part of this working group, so we managed to sneak, so to say, um, homophobic and uh, transphobic motives together with xenophobic motives in the proposed draft law, which was going to be reviewed by Parliament. But then, in January this year, the anti-campaign started and all of our recommendations were completely neglected. This draft law was never, or it might have been reviewed by Parliament, but it was never, of course, voted. And uh, then, uh, several months later, we had the Constitutional Court deciding that this convention is anti-constitutional, it shouldn't be ratified, it was completely rejected, and this was a heavy blow in the face of LGBTI rights activists and workers and human rights workers in general because it not only um, delays the introduction of uh, homophobic and transphobic motives in the criminal code but it also immediately had implications on the uh, legal cases for legal gender recognition of trans people. Uh, we had already one rejection in August from the court uh, of a trans woman the court said that, uh, based on the decision of the Constitutional Court, which says that um, the Convention would reinforce the creation of procedures in the Republic of Bulgaria which ensure legal gender recognition of a gender different from the biological gender, from the biological sex, which is contrary to the Constitution, and immediately one trans woman was rejected. She couldn't obtain legal gender recognition on the basis of the decision. So, uh, I'm afraid the law, uh, this decision has aggravated the situation of LGBTI people with, in many, many different areas, spheres, not only with respect to hate crimes. Um, so, we still have some legal options to charge hate crimes, anti LGBTI hate crimes, as uh, hooliganism uh, under Article 131 of the Criminal Code. Unfortunately, this leads to difficulty in the further prosecution because they fall into other groups of crimes and they cannot be differentiated at a later stage. And you know already a lot about the case of Mikhail Stoyanov, so I will not repeat uh, the information about it, but it's interesting that the highest uh, court, of, uh, the Supreme Court of Cassation, decreased the sentences of the two perpetrators with the argument that there was no hooliganism associated with the case, although they recognized that it was explicitly a homophobic attack. So, you know, we are in a weird situation. If uh, it's a hooliganistic crime, then it's not, it's not prosecuted as anti-LGBTI hate crime. But if it is a homophobic crime, then if there is no hooliganism, it's somehow not so heavy. Um, about the victim support services, they are quite limited. The LGBTI organizations are actively encouraging people from who, you know, who inform us that they have suffered from some attacks or threats or any other forms of violence to report. 
or at least if they don't feel secure to go and report to the police, at least to report to us, because this creates some informal statistics, and we need the statistics in order to be able to do advocacy. Um, unfortunately, the active, most of the active uh, organizations are based in Sofia. We have a very few um, supporters based in the country outside of Sofia. So people, in order to report in detail, um, in order to have the trust, you know, to report in detail, they must come to the Rainbow Hub and uh, meet with us. Uh, there is also online reporting, which is available. Uh, it could be also anonymous, but anonymous reports cannot be further investigated. That's the problem. They only give a, a picture of what is happening in the communities and not only in the but among people who have suffered under LGBTI hate crimes. And of course there are good practices among some NGOs like the Bulgarian Healthy Committee, uh, Imago Association of Psychotherapists who have openly declared that they work with LGBTI victims, but there are very few and also, again, based in Sofia, most of the shelters and support uh, centers uh, which are uh, in the country, they have not openly declared that they serve LGBTI victims, and that's why very few people who have suffered such attacks are referring to them uh, for support. Um, also, there is, of course, the problem with uh, difficulty to fit in transgender, or gender non-conforming people, because most of the shelters are for women only, or and only, I mean, their gender is uh, differentiated, and transgender people don't fit there. Nevertheless, our interviewing of uh, people working in support centers showed that they are open to working with LGBTI, and they need more training, and they are ready to take more training in order to be prepared how to provide such services. So this is on the good and on the right side. And um, yeah, I will conclude with the, uh, the short um, summary that we need the law in order to be able to make more impact in our advocacy for sensitizing the police, for example, and the prosecution. In order to achieve more impact, we need legal basis. Without the legal basis, the work of the NGOs is uh, somehow partial and um, I would say a lot of good pilot trainings have been conducted in Bulgaria but then they never reached the stage of uh, being part of, of the system, you know, of the regular practice in the institutions and um, in this way the good practice is lost over time because there is, you know, some uh, increased sensitivity when there is a, a project, a, a, an externally funded project by the European Commission or by other external source, and there is increased sensitivity of the issue, and then when the funding ends, uh, the sensitivity somehow goes back to zero, because regular work needs to be done, and this work should be part of the system. Of course, I'm exaggerating a little bit. We, we do have some... Um, results with every project, but we need to be able to uh, introduce them on the institutional level and this to be supported with, the, with policies coming from the government, because otherwise the NGOs cannot replace the work of the public institutions. We are not so powerful to, to do work, the work of public institutions and to change tremendously the situation in the whole country. Uh, we need to be vigilant and uh, pressure, exercise pressure, but at the same time there should be an open hand, um, I mean, a hand on the other side for joint work, for partnerships, and for collaboration. So, thank you for your attention.
so we'll try to be short to uh, open the floor for questions uh, for my colleagues. Um, first and foremost, I have to apologize in advance to Carolina because I'm going to show uh, that legal fetish she was complaining about <laughs> before, before me. Uh, but yes, I agree with you that the legal framework is not everything. But since I'm a jurist, it's my DNA to, to speak about law and legal provisions. But I agree with you, I mean, uh, law is not everything. But at the same time, I believe that um, the legal framework is not the enemy. But the enemy is who can change, I mean, the legal framework and doesn't. And this is very important to uh, kind of think we need your help in my presentation. And because speaking of Italy, for example, in the LGBT community, uh, uh, how can I say, a queer attitude is very widespread, and so the, the system, the legal framework, which is part of the system, is seen as the enemy. But it, according to me, it's not the actual enemy, it's just I mean, legal provisions are a means to do something. So if legal provisions are not good, or not good enough, we need to change them, to change them, but they are not the enemy. So it's important for me for this reason to speak uh, to load, despite this legal fetish that maybe I will show now. If the presentation starts, otherwise <laughs> I won't. And Carolina will be happy. Hello. Okay. Oh, it's not there. And speaking of. Uh, the legal framework and the system is uh, even more important uh, for Italy because contrary to uh, other countries in this come forward project, uh, Italian professional uh, show in the, in the research a very good degree of consciousness, of awareness about hate crime and what the hate crime is, uh, even if uh, most of them uh, never never registered the hate crime in their, in their life, especially from um, especially police from those peripheral stations. Maybe they have, they have not seen a hate crime on any grounds in their whole life, but still they know, in general, but they know what the hate crime is. So for me it's important to speak about the system, because the system is not so styled as in Bulgaria, uh, where the police uh, can treat badly uh, an LGBT uh, victim. So the PowerPoint is the But it doesn't work. By hand. Okay. So, uh, until 2018, uh, the Italian Criminal Code uh, uh, did not provide any official definition of hate crime. And this would make Carolina happy because she's against official definition of hate crime. <laughs> I'm joking, Carolina, sorry. Let's stop it. So, we don't have an official definition of hate crime, but. Uh, we usually uh, consider in the current legislation these uh, two articles of the criminal code. So, Article 604 uh, there, and six bis, and 604 there. Uh, and they are under a new section called Crimes Against uh, Equality. Article six, uh, 604 uh, bis punishes, as you can see, uh, the racist propaganda, the commission or incitement to commit discriminatory acts, uh, the establishment of association organization with this purpose, with this purpose and it contains uh, also penalty enhancement if this act are committed uh, with the denial or minimization of the Holocaust. So basically, uh, this article punishes what we can call hate speech uh, on the grounds uh, of race, uh, religious, ethics and so on. The next article, Article 604 there, uh, contains a penalty announcement, a general penalty announcement for uh, uh, any crime in the criminal code uh, committed, motivated by hate or by a discriminatory intent, except for uh, those crimes already punished with a life sentence because in Criminal, in the Italian criminal code, uh, the life sentence is the maximum penalty we have. So apart from 
a crime punished with life sentence, all the other crimes can be uh, increased with, the, with this penalty announcement if they are committed with a bias motivation but limited to some grounds, uh, which are race, ethnicity, nationality, and religion. So neither article, this uh, neither term of crimes against equality at the moment, until 2018, contains any reference to uh, sexual orientation and gender uh, identity, but race, ethnicity, nationality, and religion. We were attempting in the past to, uh, to amend the law uh, with, two, uh, with two bills, but uh, neither uh, of the two achieved the full approval in the Parliament. In, 19, in 2009, a bill uh, was prepared to recognize bias, uh, bias motivation based on sexual orientation and gender identity, uh, not as part of this article, but as the new uh, in Italy, we had this, uh, how can I call it, uh, preliminary voting, so the Parliament can vote on a bill without discussing it. It's like uh, uh, judging a book from the front cover without opening it. Okay? So, uh, according to the Parliament, the bill was so uh, unconstitutional from the, from the front cover that it was, never dis it was not even discussed, just considered unconstitutional and never voted. In 2013, another bill was, uh, was proposed by a broader and mixed coalition uh, and, and it contained an extension, no, it's, no, and it contained uh, an extension of the crimes against equality, especially uh, the provision about hate speech, so Article 604 bis. You know, we love Latin, you know, it's not a problem for us. Um, and it was, and the, uh, the amendment was approved by the lower chamber, by the Chamber of Deputies, but never approved by, by the Senate. And so the, uh, so never approved by the Parliament, by, the, by, the, by both chambers by the end of the uh, legislature. And honestly, I'm quite happy that it wasn't approved by the Parliament in the end, because together with the amendment, together, together with the uh, addition of uh, these two new grounds for bias, so sexual orientation and gender identity, the Parliament uh, had also uh, included an exception for political parties and religious bodies. So, uh, in the uh, amendment uh, law, uh, uh, in addition to racist propaganda and ethnic propaganda and so on, there was uh, also, uh, sexual, orient uh, sexual orientation and gender identity as ground for hate speech. But in addition to that, there was an exception for political parties and for religious parties. So hate speech was limited to only to common people and not to politics, to politicians, for example, which was a bit crazy according to me and uh, what is more important, very likely to be unconstitutional. But in the end, it was not approved at all, so uh, the problem is up here. Um, so, uh, while the aforementioned provisions, so the two articles uh, 604 bis and there, seem inevitably uh, limited to the grounds of race, ethnicity, religion, and nationality, it does not follow from that that anti LGBT hate crimes cannot be prosecuted at all or must be necessarily prosecuted as ordinary crimes. Of course, uh, anti, -BS, uh, anti LGBT bias cannot be considered per se at the moment for the time being, but there is some room for actions. You know. <laughs> uh, because the Italian, uh, the Italian framework, legal framework, provides other general aggravated circumstances uh, as the one listed in the article uh, 61 of the Free Human Code that can be applied in the case of anti LGBT hate crime. In particular, uh, the, the one provided in the fourth provision, uh, in the fourth paragraph of article uh, 61 of the Criminal Code, establishes a penalty enhancement for those crimes which are committed for the so called despicable and trivial reasons. So according to the, our Supreme Court, a trivial motivation occurs when the antisocial behavior has been induced 
by an external stimulus of such levity and banality, and it is absolutely disproportionate in comparison with the seriousness of the crime. So in other words, according to the Supreme Court, we can speak of a trivial, of a trivial reason when, according to the common feeling, the motivation behind the criminal act seems insufficient, insufficient to provoke it and therefore is not the actual cause of the crime but the mere pretext of violence. So a trivial reason is in short a non-reason. It's a pretext, it's pretextuous. On the other hand, according to the uh, Supreme Court of Cassation, the motivation can be said to be despicable when it is vile and ignoble and reveals a degree of perversity in the agent which is unjustifiable in the face of the human being, or of the human being as well as it arouses, uh, it, arou it arouses a deep feeling of repugnance in every person of average morality. So in short, I'm, I'm quoting the Court of Castation, of course, and in short, a reason can be said to be despicable when it is not supported and justified by the common morality. So, according to, to myself and according to some judges, uh, despicable and trivial reason uh, so defined can be can lie behind, can be said to lie behind anti-LGBT hate crime as detected by the Tribunal of Bari, which is a city in the south. When the, when the prosecutor successfully uh, demanded to the judges the application of disaggravating circumstance in a case about uh, an anti-LGBT crime. So in this case, uh, specifically a group of haters had verbally abused one gay man and one lesbian woman, using words like faggot, weird, and so on, and just, and just after that, beat them with brutality. So as the um, as as stated by, uh, by the tribunal, the reasons behind this, uh, this act can be qualified as despicable and trivial because they determinate the unprecedented and unjustified violence to the female victim, to the lesbian woman, uh, accused of being a lesbian, in trying to defend the, uh, the gay guy who was guilty in the deplorable vision of the accused of being uh, openly homosexual and of disclosing it with striking and typically feminine clothes. So in other words, according to the judges, the motivation were, were despicable in this case because they were rooted in homotransphobia and trivial since the violence was induced by the victim's visibility as homosexual and lack of shame in being uh, an openly uh, homosexual. So something can be done despite we don't have an aid kind legislation explicitly covering sexual orientation and gender identity. Nevertheless, the application of these provisions of the, of the article, uh, of the first paragraph of Article uh, 61 uh, of the Criminal Code, uh, I mean, it, it has though both advantages and drawbacks. Regarding the formats of the advantages, uh, Force is applicable to all crimes and is in the criminal code, so it, work, it can work like a general penalty enactment for all the crimes contained in the criminal code. And this is, of course, uh, very good. And, and secondly, allow the, the, uh, allow the judges to consider it the anti LGBT bias behind a crime. Speaking of drawbacks, on the contrary, the penalty announcement is limited to one tort. So according to this, according to this, no, 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 not yet. According to this uh, provision contained in Article 61 of the, of the Criminal Code, uh, the penalty announcement is up to a maximum of one tort of the original penalty. On the other hand, if you look at the ethical legislation, so the Articles uh, 604, uh, this and there, the penalty announcement is up to one half. So this way we are creating like a hierarchy of hate in Italy because some bias can be punished harder than the others. But still, it's, it's still better than nothing at, at the moment. Moreover, the aggravating circumstance, the penalty announcement contained in the hate crime legislation is a so-called special one, so cannot be counterbalanced by uh, any mitigating circumstance. So if you are found guilty 
of uh, of a data client based on race, you uh, you see the application of the penalty announcement, and this cannot be counterbalanced by any mitigating circumstances. This is not the case of the general circumstance as in the case of Bari and of the Article 61 of the Criminal Code. So, for example, one uh, very common mitigating circumstance is not to have uh, ever committed any crime in your life. In that case, this mitigating circumstance can be counterbalanced with the aggravating one. So, in that case, the aggravating circumstance for the eighth crime is gone. And this is, of course, the problem. <coughs> From the side of uh, victim support, uh, the lack of a proper anti-LGBT legislation uh, targeting hate crime should not have much impact on victims, uh, on victim claim and on, on the rights as directive of the as the victims directive is uh, is a piece of the European law, so it, it applies to member states regardless of national legislation. And in Italy, we have transposed the uh, directive with this, uh, with this decree and we have amended some provisions of the Criminal Code and the Criminal uh, Procedure Code uh, by introducing or amending uh, some provisions. But in the end, the transposition had both positive effect and negative effect uh, on LGBT people in the country. For example, talking, speaking of uh, poverty aspects, the decree provides now a new definition of the victim of crime, uh, which encompasses not only the persons who are directly suffered from the commission of a crime, but also in the event of death, uh, relatives, siblings, dependents, and so on, and even partners in, in a stable de facto relationship. And it was very important before 2016 because we didn't have the civil unions. Furthermore, the, for example, Article uh, 19 of the Code of, of, of Criminal Procedure now allows to take into account the discriminatory intent of the aggressor in anti-LGBT hate crime when qualifying the victim as vulnerable. So we don't have the hate crime legislation, but we can consider, uh, we can take into consideration, into account, the bias motivation when qualifying a victim as vulnerable. And this is uh, and the possibility of including uh, a victim and, and an LGBT victim within the notion of vulnerable victims uh, is very important uh, since it, it implies uh, some special protection rights uh, such as such as using video technology for statement taking, granting separate waiting rooms, shelters, excluding the public from the courtroom, and so on. However, it must be said that we uh, sometimes lack of trained police officers uh, and, prosec and prosecutors. So the, uh, it, it could happen that in the, in, the, in the actual life, the ignorance of special needs of anti-LGBT uh, hate crime victims, as well as general limitation of support services for victims in the country, may hinder the impact of these new, uh, in these new provisions. For example, the uh, legislative decree states that services must be offered through a proper geographical distribution across the country, but no guidance is provided on how to, this should be realized. And for the time being, no victim support services has been envisaged for LGBT victims in the country. Neither funds have been allocated to NGOs aiding uh, In contrast, a negative or impactless aspect of the uh, directive is the obligation for Italy to periodically provide the European Commission relevant statistical data about the application of national procedures on victims of crime, including, for example, the number and type of the reporting crimes. This has will have a very low impact for LGBT people in Italy. Because uh, since the uh, existing provisions in Italian penal law do not cover sexual orientation and gender identity, as we have just seen, it is not possible to discern uh, properly anti-LGBT hate crime from the other hate crime. Uh, to be honest, 
anti-LGBT hate crime cannot be recorded at all as anti-LGBT hate crime because our recording system uh, works uh, on the basis of the offense. So each offense has a different code. If that crime is not an, off an, official, off an official crime, it means that it does not have a code, a unique code. So since we don't have any hate crime legislation covering sexual orientation and gender identity as grounds, we cannot record them and, I mean, and also uh, to, uh, to look at them, to, to search for them in the, uh, in the police depository. It's impossible to find them inside it. So it, it is very probably, it's very likely that anti LGBT hate crime will, be, will, be, will go unnoticed and so this, uh, from this side, the transposition of the directive uh, will have uh, no effect. But the main problem in transposition uh, remains the uh, limited access to support services for victims. So the, the decree said that the state uh, will provide support services based on the needs of victims. But at the moment, these, these are just words, not facts. So at the moment, the state has not provided yet any support services for this type of victims. So, uh, coming to conclusions, the use of different uh, criminal provisions to investigate and prosecute anti-LGBT hate crime is of course just a stopgap and cannot be said to replace appropriate crime legislation. Both in the shape of substantive provision and as a penalty enactment measures or aggravating circumstances. Because, but of course, the introduction of a new legislation is a prerogative of the Parliament, so we can work on with the tools that we have at the moment. At the moment, we have these uh, aggravated circumstances contained in Article 61 of the Criminal Code. So, what can be done in Italy in the meanwhile is to continue raising awareness on the numbers and on the country spread of episodes of violence against LGBT people, and so to force put pressure on the parliament to, to, to legislate. And it was said before me that NGOs may have a crucial role in this task. But uh, this is not uh, probably uh, the case of Italy uh, because, uh, because uh, Italian NGOs uh, do not have the, the power to do that. From our study in, in, in Come Forward, uh, only one NGO, LGBT NGOs, has a protocol in force uh, to collect data about victims. They seek support to them, but they have never published the report. So we were told that they had a protocol, but we have no proof of that. The other NGOs, they say not to have a protocol at all and not to collect any data about victims, about episodes, or any data about the uh, victims who come to them to seek support services and they do not do any follow-up on victims. So what they do usually is to provide a very basic legal aid with lawyer and that so so they, not, they do not provide any psychological support, they do not provide shelter, but uh, last but not least, they do not collect data, they do not they do not know how to collect properly data about hate crime, about meetings, they seek support at them. And this is, of course, a big problem for my country because if the state does not collect any data and the NGOs do not collect any data, this means that no one is collecting data. Even the, um, to be honest, Italy uh, communicates uh, every year some data to Odier and this are called official statistics, but indeed they are not. This is not official. This is very unofficial because, as I said, we cannot record it at LGBT at crime as such. So this data uh, comes from an office which is called OSCAD, and it is uh, an office uh, belonging to the Ministry of Interior, uh, who collect data, but but from newspapers basically. 
So they see uh, the news on the newspaper, and uh, after that, they call the police stations. And since they are the Minister of Interior, they ask for more information about the case. And since the episode has just happened, because it was in the newspaper the day before, they can speak directly to the policeman who has recorded the episode and who has, of course, the information. But this is how, at the moment, we officially collect data about anti lgbt crime and communicate in water. So they are very unofficial. And this is also because they are just an handful of cases, because they are just the cases that the office can read in national newspapers. Thank you for the attention. Very 
I would say to some extent unexpected, also very humiliating to women especially. Um, it was a heavy blow not only against LGBTI but against women's rights in general in this country because we uh, have a long history of uh, women being in all kinds of professions, <laughs> not only in profession of nurse and, uh, uh, or uh, mother and housewife, but uh, um, the Constitutional Court issued the decision and it, it, it created a lot of, a lot of uh, intense public debating and the, the battle is not over because uh, uh, it will be addressed further by all human rights uh, activists. Um, and, uh, but you know, this is, I think it's just a, a, a result of this particular situation created in Bulgaria by the campaign against the ratification of the Istanbul Convention. And it's not a secret that this campaign was very heavily subsidized by international sources related to some uh, churches, religious movements, and so on. Uh, but unfortunately in Bulgaria, a good constellation happened between these uh, uh, you know, parties and the, our nationalists who are on the side of traditional values and uh, protecting traditional values. So uh, 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 this discourse once started by, uh, to some extent, external for Bulgaria um, <coughs> sides, you know, it, it really become, became very widespread, supported by uh, all nationalist uh, parties, and uh, this uh, really created the situation that we are now dealing with. And now gender, you know, the word gender in Bulgaria, although it was used for many years in academic uh, circles, there were courses in the universities on uh, gender studies, for example, uh, but nobody thought of gender as a dangerous word until 2018. And suddenly, in 2018, gender became a, gen a very dangerous word. Uh, it's already used as a slang, so you, you can imagine how widespread this is. It is used as a slang, as a synonym of weird, or even as a synonym of uh, gay, or as, you know, something which is out of the norm. And uh, because until last year, uh, the teenagers were insulting each other with uh, gay, now they insult each other with gender. You are gender, you know, it's like unbelievable. Um, <laughs> how, how, how really deep and widespread this campaign, and the effect of this campaign is in Bulgaria right now. So at the moment, it's very difficult to advocate for any uh, rights which are associated with gender, whether it is related to crime or marriage or whatever, if it's associated somehow to gender diversity, gender nonconformity, or even to the word gender itself, which is used instead of sex, because in Bulgarian language we have sex for biological gender, I mean another word, uh, for biological gender, it's the word sex. We don't have the word gender, it's imported. And it, it doesn't have a very good, proper translation. Uh, so now it's massively used as it is in English, gender, and it's used as an insulting word. This is the situation. Can I just a quick reply to this? I, I... I never, I never said that we didn't need laws. I just think it's very naive to think that they will solve all the problems. You know, if we have laws, that's basically it. Um, okay, so thank you very much. They were very interesting. My name is Natalie. I come from Cyprus. I'm a lecturer at the University of Central Lancashire, and I direct a, a national NGO. I found I found your presentations very interesting. I do agree very much that we need a concerted effort. Um, and I think what it is, is that we're spending so much time because there's such a great wall before us in terms of passing legislation that uh, it, it just takes so much of our time. Um, and it's, it's such a path. Um, but there's something conspicuously missing from what the three of you said. And I think it's something that is missing from the whole debate on, on anti-LGBT hate crimes. 
We are not acknowledging uh, the massive uh, negligence that has been committed at an international and European uh, level. So, when the European Union decided to do something about hate speech and hate crime in 2008, after about seven years of fighting, uh, all they did was pass a document which would uh, punish uh, hate crime committed against ethnic and religious groups. There was no incorporation of anti-LGBT crimes. Now, had we had that framework decision incorporating uh, anti-LGBT crimes, we would have had a much stronger card to debate with uh, with our country. So, talking for the example of my country, we had nothing on hate crime legislation. The only time we got something is when they got the facts from the Commission about the framework decision. Had that facts also included the LGBT, uh, anti-LGBT hate crimes as referred to there, we would have been working, I'm not saying it would have been an easy setting, this will never be an easy setting, uh, in a better setting. So the European Parliament has picked up on that, it has issued a re resolution that you've forgotten entire groups who need protection. Uh, and I think that those of us who are able uh, within their uh, NGOs or universities or other groupings to lobby uh, on, on another level or even with, with informal discussions in conferences or where we see these people uh, working in the institutions here and there. I go every year to the high level meeting on racism and xenophobia and every year I tell them the same thing and every year the it's like a deja vu every year. Every year they're like, yeah, 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 you're right. And that minister of it's the, the defense usually that represents the Netherlands, every year is so happy uh, with this position, but every year we have nothing. So we also need to pressure on that kind of level. I know for those of us, with, like us working on national level, it is very difficult, but some kind of concerted effort, because if that gap remains, um, we are going to have a hard time. That's all I just wanted to add to your great presentations. Thank you. I don't think there's much more time. I mean, you, you're going to start this session? Okay. Um, now you can go to the next. I'll close my remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, of course.